cannot teach the titan law as given you are bringing back what is dead to life he takes away the first that he may establish the second the titan law is dead the bible says the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire he killed malachi 3 that he may establish the second so if they take you to malachi 3 take them to revelation 22 that the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire so the titan law has been killed it must not exist side by side the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has set me what free from the law of sin and death join dr abel damino the senior pastor of power city international as he explores exegetically bible doctrine on tight and tithing date from sunday 14th of march to sunday 21st of march 2021 time monday 15th to saturday 20th 6 p.m daily sundays 8 a.m and 11 a.m gmt plus one join the broadcast on radio aquibum 90.5 fm uyo 11 a.m to 1 p.m xl fm 106.9 uyo 1 p.m to 3 p.m daily unuyo fm 100.7 3 p.m to 5 p.m comfort fm 95.1 uyo 6 p.m to 8 p.m inspiration fm 105.9 uyo 9 p.m to 10 p.m and heritage radio 104.9 10 p.m till midnight and also on kingdom live network station also live on facebook at abel damino public figure youtube abel damino ministries international twitter abel damino and instagram at abel damino watch real time host doctors abel and rachel damino don't miss out
salvation. Say, Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we rejoice. And we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to your people tonight. Thank you that revelation knowledge is gifted us tonight. Bodies and yokes are destroyed and whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. We decree that your word comes with clarity. Your people built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus glorified. Thank you that by the end of this service, we'll all be the better for it. In Jesus' precious name and every believer says a powerful amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together. So say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word 
naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media community. We are so glad to welcome all of you and the whole Aquaibom State community connected to the service tonight. We want to welcome all of you by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, you know your FM, Heritage FM, Inspiration FM. We are so glad to welcome all of you to the service tonight. Hey guys, do me the favor you've always done. Help me call a friend, a family. Call somebody, you know, ask them to tune to this radio station. Life is flowing through the airwaves. It's going to be an exciting study of God's word tonight. Social media community like you've always done, help me again today. Let's get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let's lighten the dark places of the earth. Help me share the video on your page and share with as many groups as possible. Join as many as possible. Let's get the gospel to the ends of the earth and the truth of the gospel tonight. Help me also create watch parties. Tag some people. Of course, put them on monogram, telegram, and WhatsApp groups. Let's get the word around the world. I also want to welcome all our campuses tonight and all our Bible study centers and everybody connected to the service tonight. Hey guys, get ready. We're going to adventure together in the word of his grace. All right? Fasting your seatbelts. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word tonight. <clears throat> Praise God. All right? We're still examining understanding Bible truth on tithe and tithing. Understanding Bible truth on tithe and tithing. Yesterday, we started looking at the Bible doctrine of the tithe and tithing. We looked at the myths. We're looking at the practice and the malpractice of tithe and tithing. As a pastor, my responsibility is to teach on every subject of scripture so I can bring you understanding. It's critical to observe that Brother Paul never mentioned the word tithe in all of his epistles, in all of the Pauline theology. Yet, it's a huge subject in the church world today. I'm telling you, very huge, very big subject. All right, now... 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For instruction in righteousness. So basically teaching is explanation. Teaching is explanation. So we teach from the Old Testament, the scriptures, the Old Testament. And teaching is possible from the Old Testament. Then from teaching, we will have reproof. Reproof, which is evidence. That is, teaching gives us reproof or evidence. And from reproof, we will have correction. And from correction, we will have instruction in righteousness, which is actually spiritual growth. One important thing about the Old Testament, which you must do, is to learn to read the Old Testament. You know, Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 12, verse number 2. Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 12, verse number 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Next verse. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was an hungered, and they that were with him? Not what David said, but what David did. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> verse 5 of Matthew chapter 12. Verse 5. Or, have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Look at verse number 7, verse 7 and 8. But if you had known what this meant, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You will not have condemned the guiltless. Verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. 
So he talks about reading the word. Have you not read the Greek word anaginosko? Have you not read? It doesn't mean to glance. It means to actually read and pay attention to what you're reading. The pastor can teach you. But you have the responsibility to read. If you read, for example, the subject of the tithe, all that was needed was for Christians over the years to just read. Just read. Don't take everything look hook, line, and sinker that you're told. Check you have a copy of the book. Just read. And you know, in the services yesterday, we saw some very clear truths. We saw that the tithe was never money. The tithe was food. Some people, well, you know, will say, well, it's because there was no money. That's why they were, they were asked to give food. And we, dip, I mean, they, some people will say because there was no money. That's why they were asked to give food. And we debunked that very clearly yesterday from scripture that when they were asked to give food as tight, there was money. And there were other professions apart from farming in Israel. Tithing was never money at any time in scripture. Never money. And Jesus never spoke about tithe as money. Look at Matthew chapter 23 verse 23 where we read yesterday. Let's look at Jesus' commentary. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Those are the three articles that Jesus factored out as their tithe. Mint, which is herbs, anise, which is herbs, and cumin, which is like curry. These are kitchen elements. And I've omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. This ought you to have done and not to leave the order undone. So Jesus said that tithing was a matter of the law. Then we had four groupings yesterday. We had tithe before the law. Genesis chapter 14, verse 17 to 20. Then we also saw the tithe during the law. During the law, Leviticus chapter number 27. Then we saw tithing in the four gospels. Of course, we read Matthew 23, 23. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. And Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 13. Then we also taught saw tithe mentioned in the book of Hebrews. So column 1, before the law. Column 2, Exodus to Malachi. Column 3, the four gospels. Column 4, the epistles. Alright, so we saw tithe in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 to 17. Now we said that column 2 and 3, which is Exodus to Malachi... And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, column 2 and 3, the Old Testament and the four Gospels, we are the same. Because Jesus said it was a matter of the law. And the law was given by Moses. And since tithe preceded the law, we cannot say Jesus was quoting Abraham. Because Abraham didn't have law. So we can only group 2 and 3 Exodus, Malachi, four Gospels together. Remember, I gave you two words. Daketo, Daketo, and Apo Daketu yesterday. To give it, to take it, and a 10%. I gave a distinction of these words yesterday. Now, we began to look at the fourth group, which is Hebrews chapter 7. And so we can say that the fourth column since it refers to Genesis 14, which is the first. So we can merge number one and number four. First and fourth column as one, and two and three as two. Remember also, yesterday, we looked at how tithing was done. We discovered that all the time the tithe was done had to do with either the farm produce seedlings what jesus mentioned were spices like curry now so today we're going to move a bit further most of what we are doing here apart from tithing is to also be able to dissolve doubts to dissolve doubts for example people have spoken about abel and there's even a more damnable one than abel's own 
I have had actually a well-respected global man of God. I was in the conference myself. Not that they told me, not video. I was physically in the conference somewhere in America. Mama and I were there in that conference. And the man of God came up to preach one of the sessions. And I was in shock. He said, you know, the scene of Adam and Eve was that they touched the tithe. They touched the tithe. That the fall of man is that they touch the tithe. I, I was taken off. I've never had such a thing before. I was like, because I have great regard for this man. And for him to say such damnable stuff, I was like, whoa. Hmm. I mean, that's not just evil, that's satanic. You know, <laughs> I've also heard people say that Abel paid the tithe. So let's look at Genesis chapter 4. Let's begin from Abel. Genesis chapter 4 verse number 4. <clears throat> and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Verse 5. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So it's clear that Abel gave the firstlings of his flock. Notice how did he give it? How did Abel give it? Who did he give it to? Because there was no priest. So who ate, who ate the tithe that Abel gave? If Abel gave anything like tithe. Because if he gave, to whom did he give it? Of course, not to his mom, nor to his dad. So, how were they offering animals and in Genesis? The best place to look at that is to look at another instance, which is in Genesis chapter 8, where things were done by Noah. What did Noah do? Genesis chapter 8 verse 20. Genesis chapter 8 verse 20. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar so obviously it was a burnt offering that abel offer because that's what they were offering in their times burnt offering now it's not difficult to clarify that look at hebrews chapter 11 let's see what he did hebrews chapter 11 because in hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 we will see what abel did <clears throat> by faith abel offered unto god a more excellent sacrifice than cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous god testifying of his gifts and by it he being dead yet speaketh so the book of hebrews didn't call what abel did tithe of first fruit he called it a sacrifice which is exactly what Noah did. They offered burnt offerings. And of course, remember that whatever Abel did was a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Whatever Abel did, because Hebrews 11.4 was after Hebrews 11.1, 1, which was talking about the fate of the Old Testament as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So which means whatever Abel did in the offering of that animal was symbolic. Was symbolic of the sacrifice of Jesus that Abel by his offering symbolized that he has faith in the ultimate sacrifice. It was not done in literal form. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24. And to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than Abel. Again, that was in an emphasis. There was the blood by faith. Abel had faith in the blood of sprinkling. The blood of Jesus symbolized by the animal sacrifice he offered. So we don't have much excuse here. Nothing about tithe is mentioned here. Genesis chapter 14 will be the next place and we will see. Yesterday I read to you historical books that let us see the tithe was a historical practice that preceded Abraham. I'm sure you remember that. Now, it wasn't something that started with Abraham. So, Abraham just did what was a norm in his day. 
Look at Genesis chapter 14 and we will look at Hebrews chapter 7. Let's begin with Hebrews chapter 7 verse 20. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 20. And in as much as not without an oath, he was made a priest. So what exactly happened in Genesis chapter 14? Let's look at the background. Abraham came back from war. He went to war and came back from war. Question, what war? Genesis chapter 14 verse 1. Let's read. Genesis chapter 14 verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Amphrel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisa, Chedeloma, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that this made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemba, king of Zebium, Zebium, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the vale of Sidim, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they served Chedoloma, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. That is, they teamed up. Verse 4. I mean, verse 5. And in the fourteenth year came Chedoloma, and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephiams in Ashtaroth, I mean, Kanem, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Imims in Shavar, Kirathiam. All right, now look at verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 quickly. And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Param, which is by the wilderness. 7. And they returned and came to Emsphat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazon Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zobium, and the king of Bela. The same is Zohar, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidim. Verse 9. With Chodoloma, the king of Alam, and with Tadal, king of nations, and Am Am Amraphel, king of Sina, and Ariok, king of Elisa, four kings with five. So there was a battle. Nine kings, four kings teamed up to fight five kings. Verse 10 and 11, Genesis 14. And the veil of Sidim was full of slim feet, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. Verse 11. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. All right, now, so as the war went on, they spoiled Sodom and Gomorrah. Four against five kings in battle. Four won five. And they took Lot. Lot became one of the victuals of war. Now look at verse 12 to 14 of the same chapter. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eskol and brother of Anna and these were confederate with Abraham and with Abraham and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive he armed his trained servants born in his own house 318 and pursued them unto Dan <clears throat> so he had 318 men in his house who went to battle Look at verse 16 and 17. And he brought back all the goods and brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedoloma and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. All right. So now Abraham came back with everything. So strangely, from nowhere, another king is mentioned in verse 18. Verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek was a different one. 
He was not part of the nine, but he was a king. So the king of Sodom came to meet him. We have another king, the king of Salem, Melchizedek. All right? We shall see in a moment. Just be patient. So what was Abraham coming with? 318 men. And the goods of Sodom were not his own. We have said earlier, what preceded Abraham was the spoils of war. The tithe of the spoils of war, historically. Remember, we read that in the historical books. What precedes Abraham is known in world history. So, he comes back and he has the spoils of war. He has the spoils of war, not salary. He has the spoils of war. He went to war and he recovered 100% from war and he brought it home. Now, we are reading the same story because Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1, let's see what Hebrews 7 1 says. Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. So he meets a man, Melchizedek. We need to trace this Melchizedek, because people have used him for what they call tithe before the law. So a couple of folks have said that Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. I wonder where they got that from and how they arrive at that conclusion. The word priest is the word Kohen in the Hebrew. K-O-H-E-N, Kohen. It means mediator or one who comes on behalf of another before someone. Or someone who ministers mediation. Someone who ministers mediation. So, the Kohen is someone who is between two parties. He called him the priest of the most high God. You know why he occurs in the life of Abraham once? Because Melchizedek only occurred in the life of Abraham one time. You know why? Because in, in Genesis 15 verse 6, Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed. And it was counted to him for righteousness. So he didn't need Melchizedek again. Because now he's a righteous man. He has believed the gospel. But in chapter 14, he needed Melchizedek. But the moment he believed, he didn't need Melchizedek again. That's why Melchizedek only occurs once in Abraham's life. Now, so Abraham, by virtue of believing, will not need mediation anymore. But at this point, he came to Abraham and ministered mediation. This word, priest, is used nine times in the New Testament books. Nine times. In the book of Hebrews, nine times. Okay? Six times, quoting from Psalm 110 verse 4. Psalm 110 verse 4. Now, give me Hebrews chapter 5 verse 6. Let's look at this word priest. As he said also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 10. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered Jesus. Made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 17. Hebrews Chapter 7, verse 17. For he testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 21. Hebrews 7, 21. For those priests were made without an oath, 
but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swore, I will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, he is quoting from Psalm 110 verse 4. Give me Psalm 110 verse 4. <clears throat> the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, which is a prophecy about Jesus. You find the word priest used singularly nine times. Then the book of Revelation has it three times. The word priesthood, priesthood is used five times in the book of Hebrews. Five times. Five times in the book of Hebrews. The act, the practice, culture of the priesthood. Peter used it after all in 1 Peter 2.9, a royal priesthood. The word high priest is used 16 times in the New Testament Greek. High priest, 16 times in the New Testament Greek. And all the 16 times is in the book of Hebrews. Not once that brother Paul used the word high priest. Not once that brother Paul used the word high priest. So why was it so? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 tells us. Put it up for me. 1-1. One, one. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So we can figure it out that the explanation of Melchizedek or the priesthood, this already tells you that the audience were Jewish. Sundry times, diverse manners, the fathers. Fathers. And I told you, whenever you see fathers or patriarch, he is talking about the Jews. Fathers or patriarchs, he is talking about the Jews. So the audience were Jewish. The word fathers refers to Jewish. You have three kinds of people in the book of Hebrews. Three different kinds of people in the book of Hebrews. Number one, you have the Jews who had believed. The Jews who had believed. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 to 39. You can write it down. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 10, 38 to 39. Put it up for me. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3. <clears throat> for we which have believed do enter into rest. So there were the believing Jews. There were the Jews who had believed. They are the ones that the writer of Hebrews said, we are not of they that draw back. We are of they that press forward to the saving of the soul. The second audience are unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews. They are still in this audience. They are the ones the writer of Hebrews wrote to in Hebrews 10, 26 to 29. Put it up for me. Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 29. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remained no more sacrifice for sin. Next verse. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' Lord died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Next verse. Of how much sorrow punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and unholy thing and had done despite unto the spirit of grace. He says adversary which shall devour the adversary. Talking about a, a man that opposes the gospel. So two audiences, Jews who had believed, unbelieving Jews, then the third audience, you also have those. The writer is writing to be convinced. Those, the writer is writing to be convinced. We call them, the will be believing Jews. Alright? Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 to 23. 
Give me Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 and see the way the writer of Hebrews addresses that third group. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by those that heard him. So in the book of Hebrews, you have words like temple, sacrifices, Levi, bulls, goats, blood, tabernacle. Is the only book in the epistles that has unrestrained usage of those words such that you will know that the audience had to be Jewish. It's very clear. Now, you couldn't communicate those kind of things to Gentiles because Gentiles didn't have temples. So they, don't, they won't understand what you're talking about. It was a language communicated to Jewish people. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 2. Hebrews 11 verse number 2. For by it the elders, referring to Jewish people, obtained good report. Hebrews 3, 1, see the general word he uses for Jewish people. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Those are words used for Jews. Knowing that the audience is Jewish and it refers to the temple. He wants to do something because Jewish people respect the ministry of Melchizedek. Why do they respect the ministry of Melchizedek? Because Abraham paid homage. Abraham, who is their father. Abraham, whom they respect, paid homage to Melchizedek. He gave respect and honor to Melchizedek. So, the writer of Hebrews is going to use Melchizedek to teach the Jews about Jesus. He will use Melchizedek to teach the Jews about Jesus. But in Hebrews chapter 7, making reference of Genesis chapter 14. So Hebrews 7 cannot be a teaching on tithe. Hebrews 7 is making reference to a historical fact. So Hebrews 7, take note, the first thing about what Abraham did to Melchizedek was that Abraham was not asked to do it. He did it of his own accord. He was not asked to do it. He did it of his own accord. The other thing you will see of what Abraham did to Melchizedek was honor. He honored him. It was honor or service. He wasn't doing it to Melchizedek to prosper. Abraham did not give Melchizedek that 10% so he can prosper. Let me repeat. He didn't do it to prosper. It was only to honor Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2. Please pay attention. Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 2. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth of part of all. First being by interpretation king of righteousness. And after that also king of Salem. The word Salem there is Jerusalem. Which is king of peace. Verse 3. Without father... Without murder, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. So again, who was this man? Salem or Jerusalem was a city recognized naturally. Now if you look at the description, the ID of the man, no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. Even Jesus didn't have that. Because Jesus had father. And he was always saying, my father. I thank you, father. So Jesus had father. But this Melchizedek, look at the characteristics. You can't say Jesus is without father or mother. So the word here is relative. Scripture doesn't talk like this. If he was going to talk about God, he would say God. He wouldn't be describing no father, no mother, no beginning, no end, no. So what does he mean without descent? Without descent explains without father and mother. Without descent is the explanation of without father, without mother. The word without descent is the word agenologetus. Agenologetus. 
a genealogetus. You can write down A G E N E A L O G E T O S. I repeat A G E N E A L O G E T O S. A genealogetus. It means unrecorded genealogy. Unrecorded genealogy. Unrecorded genealogy. What does it mean? What was he discussing? He is discussing priesthood. Who is he talking to? Jews. Who does the Jews recognize as the family that had priests? Levites. He is talking about someone who is not from Levi. So he had to say without father or mother or without descent. What does he mean? Look at that Hebrews 7, 6. Pay attention. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. He whose descent is not from them. Them who, verse 5, Hebrews 7, 5, them who, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi, them Levites, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the Lord, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So, he whose descent is not from them, Levites. So, without descent will mean without genealogy in Levi. Without descent means without genealogy in Levi. Look at verse 7 to 11. Verse 7 to 11. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes pay tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore, if therefore, perfection whereby the Levitical priesthood for under it the people received the law what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron question what is the order of Melchizedek the order of Melchizedek is that Melchizedek does not have a genealogy in Levi. The order of Melchizedek is that Melchizedek doesn't have a genealogy in Levi. What is the order of priesthood? Levi. What is the order of priesthood? Levi. Which priesthood? Priesthood according to the law priesthood according to the law look at verse 12 and 13 and 14 and pay close attention of Hebrews chapter 7 12 7, 12, 13 and 14 for the priesthood being changed there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertained to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So, if he says he is made like unto the Son of God, without father or mother, that is, 
without father or mother in Levi. Without father or mother, it is genealogy. That is, his genealogy is not in Levi. Yet, he is called a priest. He is arguing, how do you say Jesus is high priest? He is high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who is not a Levite. How? He is not calling Melchizedek God. He is saying the priesthood of Melchizedek superseded that of Aaron and it preceded it. He is not calling Melchizedek God. He is, look at the term. Look at it. Ezra. I want to show you something in Ezra. Now hold on. You know some people have what they call Theophany. Have you heard of Theophany? Theophany. Have you heard of Christophany? Christophany and Theophany means that there was an appearance of God physically in the Old Testament. Now that's not possible. Because the first appearance of God is in John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word became flesh. That was the first appearance. There has never been an appearance of God ever until the Christ was born. There has never been. Because for God to have appeared before the birth of Christ will have been incarnation. And there was never any incarnation until Christ came. So there's nothing like Christophany and there's nothing like Theophany. Just trash all of that. Now, let's get back to proper business here. In Ezra chapter 2 verse 61. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 2 verse 61. And of the children of the priest, the children of Habia, the children of Coz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. 62. This sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted put from the priesthood. They were not found in the genealogy of priests. Not that they didn't have genealogy. But they were not found in the genealogy of priests, Levites. That's exactly the story of Melchizedek. No father, no mother, or descent. No descent in Levi. His priesthood precedes Levi. His priesthood is not from Aaron. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Please pay attention. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Pay attention. But made like, made like, underline like, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. Having neither beginning of days in record. That is, we don't know where he came from. But he is made like. That is the way the record is. He is made like unto the son of God. The word made like is the word homo, homoitis. Homoitis. H-O-M-O-I-E-T-E-S. H-O-M-O-I-E-T-E-S. Homoitis in Greek is used six times. And it is always used symbolically. Homoitis is always used symbolically. That which represents another. Or that which shows how another will be. It's not the same. It represents. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 14. So you see the use of that word homoitis again. Nevertheless, that reign from Adam to Moses... Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude, similitude, after the homoitis of Adam's transgression. Similitude, homoitis of Adam's transgression. So it is symbolic. So where is Melchizedek made to resemble Jesus? In the records. In the records. That is in his priesthood. The priesthood is not like Levi. So what's going on in Hebrews 7? 
is the writer of Hebrews, just like he operates. Observe the way the writer of Hebrews functions. In Hebrews chapter 1, he tells you about Jesus and the angels and how superior Jesus is to the angels. In Hebrews chapter 2, he also tells you how superior G Jesus is to the angels. To which of the angels said he at any time, sit at my right hand. But to the son, he says, sit at my right hand. He's establishing the superiority of Jesus over the angels. In Hebrews chapter 4, I mean chapter 3, he is establishing the superiority of Jesus over Moses. Moses is servant, but Jesus is son over his house, whose house you are. In Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus and Joshua. He says, for if Joshua had given them rest, he wouldn't have spoken of another day. But Jesus has given us rest. So Jesus is superior to Joshua. Then in chapter 5, Jesus and the priesthood of Aaron. The priesthood of Aaron was the priesthood of men that died. But the priesthood of Jesus is that he lived forever. So the guy, the writer of Hebrews, is establishing the superiority of Jesus over all of that. Now, so he continues that discussion until chapter 7. Showing you the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus to that of Aaron. And he says, if there was a prophecy that there will arise a priest... After the order of Melchizedek, who was not found in Aaron. He was not found in Aaron. That Hebrew 7 was saying, unfortunately, it's not a series on Titan. But many people have turned Hebrew 7 as their scripture for tight. It was to show the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus to that of Aaron. So he says in Hebrews 7, 13, 14, 15, where we read, look at it, look at it, Hebrews 7, 13, 14, 15, pay attention. For he of whom these things are spoken, pertained to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar, 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, not Levi, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. You can't see similitude for, for same person. If this is my similitude, then it is not me. I can't be my similitude. Okay? So if Melchizedek is similitude of Jesus, then Melchizedek is not Jesus. Are we in the building? Similitude. That already shows that Melchizedek was a different personality from Jesus. And then of course, he never said Melchizedek is forever. <laughs> no. The priest that abides forever is Jesus, the son. Look at Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Hebrews Chapter 7, verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. A priest continually. Not Melchizedek. Forever is Jesus. Look at Psalm 110, verse 110 verse 4. Psalm 110 verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's not talking to Melchizedek. He's talking to somebody that is after the order of Melchizedek. Meaning this somebody does not have genealogy in Levi like Melchizedek. Are we in the building? Good. Now, that means there's a priest that will arise after the order of Melchizedek, and that is Jesus. He didn't say Melchizedek is a priest forever. Thou art a priest forever. That thou is Jesus. Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The order of Melchizedek. What is the order of Melchizedek? A priest that is not from Levi. 
So we have established something that Melchizedek was not Jesus. Hebrews 7, 17. Are you getting blessed? All right, 7, 7. For he testified, thou a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, 21. Hebrews 7, 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that saith unto him, the Lord swore and will not repent. Thou a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 24 of Hebrews 7. Pay attention please. But this man, because he continued ever, had an unchangeable priesthood. So Jesus has an unchanging priesthood which is forever. Look at Hebrews 7, 16. This describes the resurrection of Jesus. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment. But after the power of an endless life. This is the resurrection. Look at Hebrews 7, 8. Now pay attention. And here, men that die receive tithes. But there, he received them of whom it is witness that he liveth. <clears throat> Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. And as I may so say. Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. Now look up everybody. You know some people who say that Jesus receives tithe, just like Levi, when they read that verse of scripture. Now if you observe verse 8, put it up again, 7 verse 8. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he of whom it is witness that he liveth, received them is not in the original. So receive them is out. Here, men put it up that die receive tithes. But they are he of whom it is witness that he liveth. It is witnessed. He is not saying Jesus receives anything. Because Jesus does not receive anything. Jesus offered himself. He didn't receive anything. You need to renew your mind. Especially if you've been of that school of thought. The priesthood of Jesus taught in the entire book of Hebrews is not to receive, but to give. He gave his life. He gave you eternal life. He gave you redemption. It's all about him giving. Sanctification. Justification. So Jesus is not receiving tithes. He only said he witnessed that he lives. So was Melchizedek a man? Yes. Did he live forever? No. What was about his priesthood? He was not from Levi. What did Abraham do to him? Genesis 14. Kabada. Now, before we enter Genesis 14, please hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> so, who said Titan preceded Abraham? We said so because it was from spoils of war in ancient times. It's not difficult if you pick an encyclopedia, you will see all these things I'm saying. It's like the anointing oil. The person, who used, the person who used anointing for the first time was Jacob. Jacob in Genesis. It was a practice of idolatry. The use of anointing oil. It was a practice of idol worshippers. Idolatry. In those days, historically. In those days after war, they will offer 10% of the spoils of war. They offered it to deities or those who represented deities. They are historical. What both anointing oil usage and titan? They are all historical. Same thing Jacob did. He anointed a place. Just like the idol worshippers anoint places for sacrifice with oil. It was their practice. That's exactly what Abraham did to show honor. 
So Abraham was following a custom. A custom of those days. Let's unbundle the story. Are you ready? Let's unbundle Genesis 14. Remember, there were nine kings at war. Four against five. Why did Abraham intervene? Not because he liked any of the kings, but because of his nephew Lot in Sodom. And the king of Sodom was not strong enough to defend his territory. So Abraham takes 318 men and he goes to fight. He goes to slaughter. He brings back the goods. So look at Genesis 14.21 now. Genesis 14.21 And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Give me verse 16 first. 16. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back, brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. He recovered the people and the goods. And the king of Sodom said, give me the people. Take the goods to yourself. Look at what Abraham said to the king of Sodom. Verse 22. 14, 22. So Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. The possessor of heaven and earth. Give me 23. 14, 23. That I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. <laughs> that which is thine. So what he brought back from the war belongs to Sodom. None of it belongs to Abraham. But the goods and the people belong to Sodom. Now, it was not Abraham's salary. It was spoils of war. Are we in the building? If he gave 10% to Melchizedek, how much was left? 90%. Okay? So, he gave 10% to Melchizedek, which was customarily, or customary in their days. Then he has 90%. So, who took the 90%? The king of Sodom. So, he gave 90 to the king of Sodom, took 10, gave to Melchizedek, because none of it belongs to him. He only went on behalf of a country to fight and brought victory which belongs to the country. But by custom, they took 10% and gave to a deity he respected. Are we teaching? So Abraham had nothing. Now, what did Abraham give Melchizedek? Oh no. Abraham had nothing. 90% to the king of Sodom, 10% to Melchizedek. Abraham was prosperous without 10%. Before he paid the tithe, he was already prosperous. He didn't pay the tithe or give the tithe to prosper. He was already a prosperous man without tithe. If Abraham was not prosperous, he wouldn't have won the war. A rich, a poor man cannot have 318 soldiers living in his house. As bodyguards. Even your billionaires today don't have such bodyguards. Yet Abraham had them in his house. Living in his house. They were fed and paid salary. That's not a poor man. If you don't pay tithe to be taxed. Don't stop that. Melchizedek. I mean Abraham did not give tithe to be rich. He was already rich. That's why he went and won the war. Please, that's important. The titan principle here has nothing to do with prosperity. Nothing. Nothing. If you're writing, write it in capital letters. It was a war tithe. And you will see it again. Look at Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Genesis chapter 
13, sorry, verse 1 to 6. Genesis 13, 1 to 6. Genesis 13, 1 to 6. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. Next verse. And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. Chapter 13, before he gave Melchizedek 10%, the man was very rich. He went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Four, four to six, we're going to six. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great. These were rich people, so that they could not dwell together. They were already wealthy before any 10% of war. And they were not paying tithe to be wealthy. They were businessmen in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Are we teaching? Abraham in verse 2 was rich. Something with the man Lot. I mean, same thing with the man Lot. Lot was equally wealthy. He had herdsmen. He had cattle. Very rich people. How did Abraham get his money? Chapter 12. Married a beautiful wife. And the rest is history. He had a beautiful wife. And he was using her to be manipulating people. Manipulate people. And collect money, manipulate. He was using his wife. He was a very crooked man. Very dubious Abraham. That's why the Bible never asks you to learn anything from Abraham other than his faith. Only his faith. Not his character, not his morality. The faith of Abraham. Faith without works. Faith in what Christ will do. That's what we learn from Abraham. He was a shrewd businessman. Very crooked guy. Abraham. <laughs> what was the percentage you gave to Melchizedek? 7%. <laughs> it is called tight from the spoils of war. Tight. That is different from tightening under the law. Tightening under the law is food stuff. This one is tight of the spoils of war, which is his, you know, historic, historic in the days of Abraham. You know, and uh, Moses applied something else. Because it is called spoils of war tithe. It's a custom of those days. That when you win war, you pay 10% to deities. And he did it to the priests of the most guy. In, in Numbers 31, you see what I told you, that the tithe of Genesis is not the same with the one under the law. Numbers 31, 26. Numbers 31, 26. Take the sum of the prey that was taken, both of man and of beast, thou and Eliza, the priests and the chief fathers of the congregation. Next verse. And divide the prey into two parts, between them that took the war upon them and who went out to battle and between all the congregation. Next verse. And levy a tribute unto the Lord of the men of war which went out to battle, one soul of 500, both of the persons and of the beeves, and of the asses and of the sheep, 29 to 30. Take it of their half and give it unto Eliza the priest for a heave offering of the Lord. And of the children of Israel, half, thou shalt take one portion of 50 of the persons of the beeves, of the asses and of the flocks and of all manner of beasts, and give them unto the Levites, which keep the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. So Moses gives a different principle totally. In Moses' time, it was not 10%. It was 1.1% from the spoils of war. You give 1.1% from the spoils of war. So it was in their custom, even though the percentages were not the same, but it was in their custom that when you win war, when you come back, you give a percentage to deities. So Moses returned a percentage for spoil of war, but it was not 10. And they are dealing with the same thing, spoils of war tithe. So never at any time was tithe used for prosperity. Never. Not in Genesis at all. 
Abraham was not wealthy because he gave tithe. In fact, he took nothing from the spoils of war. He gave everything to the king of Sodom. Hebrews 7, therefore, was about priesthood, not tithing. The second person that gave tithe is Jacob. Genesis 28, 20. Genesis 28, verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on. Next verse. So that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Then shall the Lord be my God. Next verse. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. From all that Jacob had been doing. You know Jacob? Okay. <laughs> he fled from his brother. He was running from his life. Then he made a commitment. Question. Did he do it? I don't think so. There's no such record. He vowed. But there's no record where he did it. And if you know Jacob. Jacob, right? In the two instances we have read. Did God demand anything from them? It was they... Who offered. It appears like they were following a custom. Let's go back to Moses. In the law, there were three kinds of tithes. Three different kinds of tithes. So that's why when a pastor is saying pay tithe, ask him which one? Which of them? Because under the law, there were three kinds of tithes. Remember, there are two types of tithes. Two types. And under the law, there are three kinds. Two types. Tied from spoil of war, which only is paid when there is war. Then the other tithe, which is tied under the law. And even that tithe under the law is three kinds. Three kinds. So when a pastor say pay tithe, ask him which of them. And I will show you which, how many, I will show you the three kinds. And I will also prove to you that tithe is not 10%. Tithe is not 10%. We will we'll calculate together, don't worry. <laughs> so, in the law, there were three kinds of tithe. And many people don't even know it. And, uh, you know, we will see it together. The first kind of tithe is called the Lord's tithe. The Lord's tithe. The Lord's tithe. Numbers 18.20. Numbers 18.20. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am, I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. Next verse. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tent in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Next verse. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh. Henceforth come nigh to the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they be a sin and die. So the first one is, I will give you a tenth of what everybody has. The Lord's tithe. The Lord's tithe. So what happened was this. Look at Joshua 21 verse 4. Joshua 21 verse number 4. And the Lord came out for the families of Kohotites and the children of Aaron the priests which were of the Levites had by lot out of the tribe of Judah and out of the tribe of Simeon and out of the tribe of Benjamin 13 cities. So they had how many cities? 13 cities. Verse 9 to 19 of Joshua 21. Joshua 21, 9 to 19. And they gave out of the tribe of the children of Judah and out of the tribe of the children of Simeon, these cities were, are here mentioned by name. With the children of Aaron, being of the families of the cohort, cohortites, who were of the children of Levi had, for theirs was the first lord. And they gave them the city of Abba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron, 
in the hill country of Judah with the suburbs thereof round about it. But the fields of the city and the villages thereof gave they to Caleb the son of Jephunneh for his possession. Those they gave to the children of Aaron, the priest Hebron, with her suburbs, to be a city of refuge for the slayer, and Libna with her suburbs, and Jati with her suburbs, and Estomia, Estomoa with her suburbs, and Holon with her suburbs, and Deborah with her suburbs, and Ain with her suburbs, and Judah with her suburbs, and Beshemesh with her suburbs. Nine cities out of two tribes. And of the tribe of Benjamin, Gibeon with her suburbs, Geba with her suburbs, Anathoth with her suburbs, and Almon with her suburbs, four cities. All the cities of the children of Aaron, the priests, were 13 cities with suburbs. Now, you will see the relevance of that very soon. Numbers 35 8. Numbers 35 8. And the cities which you shall give shall be of the possession of the children of Israel. From them that have many, you shall give many. But from them that have few, you shall give few. Everyone shall give of his cities unto the Levites. According to his inheritance, which he inherited. So they dwell there. All the Levites dwell there. But all the Levites were not priests. Priests dwell in tabernacles. Those who are not priests dwell in cities. That is, they were given a place to stay. But those places they stayed was not their own. It was just given to them to stay. Numbers 35, 7. Numbers 35, 7. So all the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be forty and eight cities. Them shall you give with their suburbs. Verse 8. And the cities which you shall give shall be of the possession of the children of Israel. From them that have many, you shall give many. But from them that have few, you shall give few. Everyone shall give of his cities unto the Levites according to his inheritance which he inherited. Where they still, where they will still stay. So Levites saw these as from their own lands. Levites from Levi. Then they had priests. Not all priests. I mean not all Levites were priests. And we will see the relevance soon. So this particular tithe, which is the Lord's tithe, Numbers 18, 9 to 11. Lots of scriptures, but that's the only way to establish doctrine. This shall be thine of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every oblation of theirs, every meat offering of theirs, and every sin offering of theirs, and every trespass offering of theirs, which they shall render unto me, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. Then, in the most holy place shalt thou eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy unto the Lord. 11. And this is thine, the heave offering of their gift, with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel, I have given them unto thee, unto thy sons, unto thy daughters with thee, by a statue forever. Everyone that is clean in the house shall eat it. This one, they eat it in the temple. Levites will eat it in the temple. Look at verse 31. Numbers 18, 31. And you shall eat it in every place, ye and your household, for it is your reward for your service. In the tabernacle of the congregation. Look at verse 10. Numbers 18.10. Numbers 18.10. In the most holy place shall thou eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy unto the Lord. So this particular tithe. You eat it in the temple. The first one is the Lord's tithe. That is where you give to the Levites. 10%. I mean the priest. The second one, you eat it in the temple. This is what you can call the Levite's tithe. It was never brought into the storehouse. They ate, sorry, they ate it in every place. Verse 31. Numbers 18, 31. And you shall eat it in every place. Ye and your household, for it is your reward for your service. In the tabernacle of the congregation. 
Look at Nehemiah 10.37. Nehemiah 10.37. And that we should bring the first fruit of our dough and our offerings and the first fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and of oil unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. They will have the tithes in all the cities, not in the temple. In all the cities. Okay? The Levites tithe. They eat it in the cities. Then there's the Lord's tithe that is brought to the priests. Are we following? So when you say Malachi 3.10, which says bring 10% into the storehouse, you have, to, you have to be able to explain which of the 10%. Okay, now, so you have seen the tithe eating out of the storehouse and the tithe taken into the storehouse. They are not the same. The one eating out, the one taken into are not the same. Numbers 18, 20. Look at it. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I die, I thy part and thy inheritance among the children of Israel. So the Levites don't have any property of their own. So even where they were living was rented or given to them, uh, you know, uh, was just given to them to use. They didn't own it. Now go to Leviticus 27, 30 to 34. Leviticus 7, 30 to 34. I mean 27, 30 to 34. Leviticus. 27, 30 to 34. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem out of his tithe, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd, or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tent shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. 34. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Look at the distinction. Verse 32 to 33, he says, The ten shall be holy unto the Lord. It's called the tithe of the Lord. This was given to those who serve in the tabernacle. Remember, we have Levites, and then we have those who serve in the tabernacle. So there's a tithe for those that are not in the house, and a tithe for those in the house. So those in the house are the ones Malachi was telling that they should take it to the storehouse. Those in the house. They are the ones Malachi was telling to take it to the storehouse. Those that are not in the house, they are to eat it everywhere. They are not the same. So if you are not serving, if you are not serving your own tithe, you will eat it everywhere you are. Look at 2 Chronicles 31.15. Please pay attention. 2 Chronicles 31.15. Lots of reading, but good for you. And next, next him were Eden and Maninim and Joshua and Shemia, Amaria, Sekenia in the cities of the priests in their set office to give to their brethren by courses. As well to the great, as well to the great and as to the small. To the great and to the small. Look at verse 19. Second Chronicles 31, 19. Also of the sons of Aaron, the priests which were in the fields of the suburbs of their cities. In every several city, the men that were expressed by name to give portion to all the males among the priests. And to all that were reckoned by genealogies among the Levites. So we have those who were priests and those who were not priests. 
And yet Israel was supposed to take care of both of them. Levites that were not priests, Levites that were priests were to be taken care of. But there were those in the tabernacle serving. And those who were Levites not serving. So the tithe played two different roles to these folks. Look at Nehemiah 10.37. Nehemiah 10 37. And that we should bring the first fruit of our dough and our offering and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine, of oil, unto the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. Of our tillage. The priests from the Levites' temple. The Levites in the cities. Are you catching? The priests from the Levites temple. The Levites cities. Nehemiah 3.10. Nehemiah 3.10. And next unto them repaired Jediah, the son of Harumaf, even over against his house. And next unto him repaired Hutish, the son of Heshbaniah. So there's a portion for those who serve and a portion for those who are not serving. That's the lost tithe. The second tithe is called the festival tithe. Number one, the Lord's tithe. Number two, the festival tithe. The festival tithe. Remember, the first tithe we mentioned is given to Levites. Which among them you have the priests. And those who are not priests. The second tithe is the festival tithe. It's not the same with the Lord's tithe. Remember, under the Lord's tithe, you take care of Levites in the temple and Levites in the cities. Okay? Festival tithe. Deuteronomy 12, 1 to 19. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all. So I'll read 17 to 18. Pay attention. Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm going to read 17 and 18. You can read the rest at home, 1 to 19. Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn or of thy wine or of thy oil or the firstlings of thy herds or of thy flock nor any of thy vows which thou vowest nor thy free will offerings or heave offering of thy hand. 18. But thou must eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy man servant and thy maid servant and the liver that is within thy gates. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God in all that thou puttest thy hands unto. So the festival tithe, you are the one that will eat it, you and your family. You will bring the food to the temple Tabanaku. Then you will eat it and rejoice. Then other Levites that are there, you can share with them. That's the second tithe. The one you will eat. Look at Deuteronomy 14.22. Deuteronomy 14.22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. Next verse. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God. You shall eat it. This tithe, you are the one that will eat it. In the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil. And the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flock. That thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Next verse. Pay attention. And if the way be too long for you. If where you are coming from. To the tabernacle is too far. So that thou art not able to carry the food. Tight is food. Or if the place be too far from thee. Which the Lord thy God shall choose. To set his name there. When the Lord thy God has blessed thee. Next verse. Then thou shalt turn it into money. And bind up the money in your hand. And shall go unto the place. Which the Lord thy God shall choose. Next verse. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. 
You will use the money when you arrive the place to buy anything you like for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink. <laughs> Put it back. <laughs> you will buy anything you like, including strong drink. <laughs> you use your tight to buy strong drink. <laughs> or for whatsoever thy soul desire it. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household. <clears throat> The first one we read, <laughs> why are you people laughing? <laughs> Alcohol. Eh? <laughs> now, the first one we read, who is to eat it? The Levites and the priest. The second tithe, who is to eat it? The person that owns it will eat his tithe. That's the second tithe. This one, you go into the temple in Jerusalem and everyone will eat. Everybody comes there to Jerusalem. And he said, if it is far from your town, sell the food, carry the money. When you arrive, then you buy whatever you desire. Then you come to the temple with it and eat it. So when they say, pay tight, ask them, which one? <laughs> which one? The one I will come with my family and eat? <laughs> which tight am I to pay? So, we have how many tithes now? Two. So, how many percent? Twenty percent. Ten, the Lord's tithe. Ten, festival tithe. Are you following? So, this particular one, you eat your tithe and you rejoice. You, you, you eat it. He said, of thy own. The Levites didn't have. But he said, when you get into the temple, share with the Levites as you are eating. Share with them. Deuteronomy 14 says, if it's far, convert it to money because of the distance. Because food stuff is heavy. So the tithe was not money. And then when you get to Jerusalem, buy whatever you want. So it is still not money because you cannot eat money. It's called the festival tithe. The third one is the tithe for the poor. The tithe for the poor. Deuteronomy 14.28 Deuteronomy 14.28 At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thy increase the same year and shall lay it up within thy gates. Now remember the festival tithe is once a year. Then the tithe for the poor is done every three years. Deuteronomy 14, 28 to 29. As a roundup for the day. Tomorrow we fire more. Deuteronomy chapter 14, 28. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year and shall lay it up within thy gates. Next verse. And the Levite, because he had no part, no inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hand, which thou doest. This tithe is for the poor, orphans, strangers, fatherless, and it is done once every three years. Now look at Deuteronomy 26, 12. Deuteronomy chapter 26 verse 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing, and has given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Next verse. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away all the hallowed things out of my house, and also have given them unto the Levite, and unto the stranger, to the fatherless, to the widow, according to all thy commandments which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandment, neither have I forgotten them. So, there's also called a year of tithing. So, we have the tithe, which is once every three years, the other ones yearly. So, if we calculate the tithes, 
The Lord's tithe is how much? 10%. The festival tithe is how much? 10%. The tithe for the poor, you divide 10 into 3. 10 divided by 3. That would be 3 point something. 3.3 huh? 3 something. 3.3 3 something. So the tithe is 23%.3. Point three. Is 23.3 percent. That's the tight. So, key fact as you go. Number one thing in the 40 years, in the 40 years that they were instructed, nobody paid tight. 40 years after they were instructed. For the 40 years, nobody paid tight. Because the tithe or the tithing was supposed to be when they entered Canaan. When they entered Canaan. That's why he said in the land. You don't call something in the land when you are still in the journey. In the land. That means Moses was not around when they started paying tithe. And that means Moses never paid any tithe. Because they were to do it in Canaan. And it took them 40 days. I mean 40 years. Of that instruction. Before they got into Canaan. Are we in the building? Yeah. So that means. For those 40 years. Nobody paid tithe to anybody. And as we read on. You will find out. That one of the law of tithing is that. If you are poor you don't pay tithe. We will see it. You, poor people are not supposed to pay tight. Instead, when others pay tight, it's supposed to be shared for poor people. Poor people are not supposed to. I will show you tomorrow. Are we blessed tonight? Get on your feet. Let's close this service. Glory to God. A lot of teaching, a lot of study, but that's the way to arrive at understanding. Can I have a good amen? Praise God. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's pray tonight. Father, we rejoice for the privilege to learn to be equipped to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Thank you that as we keep growing, understanding is coming. It makes us effective. It makes us efficient. And it makes us able to help others. And we rejoice that you are building up an army of people all over the world that will preach the truth of the gospel without fear. And we rejoice that the revelation of God's word keeps growing in our heart. Thank you for freedom from the law. The, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. And I decree and declare tonight, anyone hearing the sound of my voice that is sick in body, be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you for answered prayer tonight. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory. Amen. amen. Woo. Grab a good offering. Let's give quickly. And I'm joining Mr. Michael Bush in the next one or two minutes as we bring you Ask the Counselor. You don't want to go away. It's going to be exciting. And remember, every evening, 6 p.m., the whole of this week, we're going to explore this subject of tithe and tithing and just put it to rest once and for all. All right, grab your offerings online. The banking details are scrolling. On television, the banking leaders are scrolling. Radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush will read the account for you. We give in honor of Christ. We give in faith. We give because we are persuaded that it is our responsibility to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And therefore, as responsible people of God, we give generously to enhance the spread of the gospel so people in darkness will come into the great light. Hallelujah. Lift it up to heaven, Father. We rejoice. We give in faith. Thank you that our offerings are a sweet smell tonight. And thank you for the blessing that is upon our giving. And we decree that right now, everyone giving tonight, in the name of Jesus, great ideas, concepts, insights are released upon you. My God supplies all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Enjoy the blessing of God tonight in Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Praise God. Hey guys, you know we love you. Always a joy to serve you the grace of God. I look forward to having everybody join us tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. And I tell you, share the video, share with other people the things you are learning. And if there are questions, don't forget to email those questions to ask the counselor. But sometimes when I start teaching and advice, you slow down with questions. Get to the end of the teaching. Be patient. Don't come into the teaching with I know attitude. Come in like one who is willing to learn. And let's go through the scriptures together. 
and let the scriptures explain themselves. And at the end of the day, let the scriptures arrive at the conclusion that we're supposed to carry. That's very important, especially for people that Titan has been wired in their blood. You need to relax a bit. Let the word of God be true and let everybody else be a liar. We love you guys. Looking forward to see you tomorrow. And until then, I'll see you in the next studio with Mr. Michael Bush. Enjoy the rest of your moment and be blessed. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Glory! Amen! Woo! Who Glory to God forevermore. Amen! Message. Praise For these, God. All, right. all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com with us at Still Riot Life and now get to ask the counselor. Just bank details next for especially the radio audience. Account name is Power City International. There are three banks as usual. There is FCMB, there is Zenith, and there is UBA on this edition. I start with Zenith. 10, 12, 36, 59, 12, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12. Power City International remains the account name. So too, for UBA, 139.26.465. 139.26.465. Power City International. Detail, FCMB, 29.82.68. 20, 28, 29, 82, 68, 20, 28. That's for FCMB. The next announcement that I need to put out to you is sponsorship. You want to support the program, you want to sponsor, you want to partner, anything you want to do, the number to call is plus 234. Again, if you are calling from outside the country, otherwise it's 0803 275 You email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Doctor there, of course, is DR. My name is Michael Bush. Every day, I look forward to coming here to meet minds with you, to, to put across your question to the man who sure has all the answers. Now, the best. And um, the last and the best, everything for him, is here now. He's a teacher, he's a father, he's a prolific author. He's written 32 books and counting, and also an international radio and television evangelist. Help me welcome Global Baba, Dr. Abel. Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. So good to see you this So evening. nice to see you. How have you been today? I'm fantastic. Praise God. And um, I'm even more so anytime I, I, I come. Yeah, I'm and excited And I'm privileged too. to sit by your side. I'm excited. I and look just, forward uh, Global, but, you know, I just hope and believe. I pray every day. I hope God answers that very fast. That, uh, you know, the way you teach, I can do. I don't want to do all, all 10%. 10% okay. of what you do. I'll just be comfortable. People will not drink water. I'll just uh, I'll torment people like this. <laughs> You'll be asking those questions. <laughs> oh no, so good, Papa. So nice to see you. I is Mama. Well, very all blessed. The, uh, very daughters. Blessed. Everyone. They're good. all great. They're yeah, all absolutely. great. They're all excited. From Kenya straight to Lagos, Nigeria. Hello, Global Baba and Mr. Bush. First Corinthians fourteen thirty three says, "For God is not the author of confusion." However, in the book of Genesis 11, 5 to 9, it is recorded global Baba, that God came down to confuse their language at the Tower of Babel and also scatter them. Kindly help clarify, so God bless you abundantly for me in Lagos, Nigeria. That scripture, 
it is not God who came down and scattered their language. It was the inactivity of God in the midst of their, their, their ungodly desire that scattered their language. It wasn't God. In the Old Testament, there was a mode of writing where the inactivity of God was seen as God doing something. So it's the inactivity of God. Okay, Global Baba from Lagos to Lagos. First door, another caller. Hello. Good evening. Many Good thanks. Evening, brother. Good evening. Yeah, I'm calling from Joss and that's really by me. Okay. I appreciate you and Intercontinental Mike Bush. I appreciate you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is from Genesis chapter number 9, verse 20 to 27, about Noah and his three children. The questions I want to ask, did Noah curse, uh, actually curse one of the child? And then the second question, is that child that he first happened to become the black man? I want Global about to give me clarity of that. Thank you. Well, again, you must remember that the message of the scripture is not the history of how people were caused and how people became black, white, green, yellow, purple. The message of the Bible is the message of Christ. So when you approach the Bible, look for Christ. Don't look for where black people came from. Black, it's pigmentation. It comes from the weather. It comes from our environment. You know, white people, it's their own weather. Weather contributes a lot to the color of skin. It's not whether there's a cause or not. You know, the same cause that is on, the, on a black man, if there's any cause on a black man, is on a white man. The cause is not because of color. The cause is for rejecting Christ. When you don't have Christ, you're under a cause. Okay, so don't, don't look at it that way because I know there's a school of thought that teaches that stay away from that school of thought. They will confuse you. All right? Noah caused his children, but that cause just stayed within that 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 operational system it did not transfer to the whole world and again you must remember that in the days of noah it was not clear the salvation plan of god even though they preached the gospel they didn't understand what they were saying because everything they were saying was pointing to christ the fullness of revelation came when jesus showed up i hope that helps you the only authentic message in the bible is the revelation of christ every other thing it's not complete. That's why the Bible has a bias. The bias is Christ. Search the scriptures. They testify of me. Fantastic. Okay. Global Papa, so we stay on in Lagos. Hello. I am Agbola Adekunle, an online follower of Dr. Abel Damina's ministry. I just moved to Lagos and reside around Iyanauba Axis in Lagos. I want to ask for the closest campus of your ministry around this location where my family and I can fellowship. Thank you, sir. I hope to hear from you soon. Oh, we have many campuses in Lagos. So what we'll do is we will connect you with Pastor Gospel, who coordinates, you know, uh, our Lagos campuses. And Pastor Gospel will give you all the, all the details of all the different campuses in Lagos. Bless you. And welcome to Power City. Amen. So Global Baba, we still around Nigeria. We have just one to, before we dash out again to other continents of the world. I accept my greetings, sir. Please help to clarify the following Bible passages within the context that God does not kill. Second Kings 1, 10 to 11 and Joshua 10 to 2, 26. Divine mercy and blessings. Jonathan Bade. Second Kings 1, 1 11. 10. 1, 10. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God. Now it wasn't God that killed. Now it's Elijah. Now. It wasn't God. And this same scripture, if you see the way the disciples of Jesus quoted that same scripture for Jesus. Look at Jesus' answer to them in Luke chapter 9 verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Next verse. And sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Next verse. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Next verse. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? It wasn't God that killed them. It was Elijah who killed them. 
And these disciples wanted to copy Elijah. Look at what Jesus said to them. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. Next verse. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. If Jesus rebuked them here in Luke chapter 9, Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever, he wouldn't have been the one walking with Elijah to kill people in the Old Testament. And that's why Jesus revealed to us in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you may have life. Jesus is God who became a man. He never killed before. He doesn't kill now. He will never kill at all. Death is a function of man's sin. So death is part of the self-destruct system that man has set in motion. The only part God plays is to bring salvation. Okay, Global Baba, so we move to Abuja, Nigeria. We will have two anonymous entries. From there, we fly out of the country and indeed the continent. Hello, dear Dr. Abel Damina, sir. You are blessed already, and may God continue to bless you throughout your lifetime for the good work you do in the vineyard of Christ Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bless you. Another anonymous entry, quickly, quickly. Dear counselor, thank you for the wonderful work you do. God bless you richly. Please kindly advise me on this matter. My wife and I got separated some time ago. It was a rather bitter separation. She made so many negative pronouncements upon my present and future well-being, most probably out of anger. I'm a firm believer, Global Baba, and I know my identity in Christ. However, from your point of view and experience, what's the implication, if any, of such pronouncements vis-a-vis -vis God's grace upon my life? Thank you. Regards. All those pronouncements have no effect. You are in Christ. They don't work. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. So what do you do? Acknowledge what you have in Christ. Acknowledge who you are in Christ. And by that acknowledgement, you neutralize everything that is contrary to what Christ has done in you. Another caller now. Hello. Hello. Many yes, thanks. So you. Your name and where you're calling from. You're calling from where? Okay, go ahead. Urak, go ahead. I want to ask um you this one. Um the Hebrews chapter what? I didn't oh. hear that. Is that 12? Is that Hebrews what? 4 verse 12. Okay. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, the word of God. The effect and the impact that the word of God, the person of Jesus has in a man's life when he is exposed by the teaching and preaching of the word. Global Baba from Abuja, Nigeria, will fly straight into the United States of America. Josian says, my friend recently lost her son in a terrible car accident. How can I help her to cope using the word of God? I have prayed with her continuously, but I believe the word heals a sorrowful heart. And she also wants to know if her son is safe. Um, Josian from USA. Wow. Our condolences. Wow. Our condolences. And uh, you know, the truth of the matter is sometimes when people come through that situation, there's not even enough you can say to mm. comfort them. Absolutely. The best thing is just, you know, mm. leave them in the hand of the Lord. Trust the Holy Spirit to bring comfort to that family. And of course, get the word of God close to them. If you get my series on the love that God has for you, you know, uh, the, love, the love of the Father, the love of God is a whole teaching series. Knowing and believing the love that God has for you. If you get that teaching series for your friend, it will help her a great deal. And my series too on the misunderstood God. The misunderstood God. Finding God in the midst of evil. The misunderstood God. Finding God in the midst of evil. Those two messages. Knowing and believing the love that God has for you. The misunderstood God. Knowing God in the midst. Finding God in the midst of evil. If you get that two series for her, it will be the best gift you have given to her in the midst of our situation right now. Bless you. From the United States, Global Baba was supposed to pray for her, for them? Yeah, Father, we ask for the comfort of the Holy Spirit for that family. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke every hopelessness. We rebuke every hold of the enemy. 
Amen. Every spirit of sorrow, we rebuke you. Amen. We command comfort and the peace of God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just in time, Global Baba, the first of our last two, three callers. Hello. Hello. Many thanks for joining us. Where are you calling from? Good evening, Mr. Bush. I'm Iman from Ethiopia. Welcome to the program, Ima. I want to thank you for what God has done in his life for making us the word of God in his home. So, the first person is the best of my children. Amen. My question I want to ask, I want to ask that why the good conference for the day for now tonight? And when she was here, and she was also great for the day and night, uh, when he was practicing, and when he was from the day, and he also stood with us all today. So what is the way of all today in the old testament and the new testament? There's no meaning. There's no meaning. All those days don't have any meaning. They don't have any significance. There's no meaning. He just went there and he was fasting and enjoying his stay. And kept doing it until it was 40 days. He was satisfied. He left. Jesus, the same thing. Actually, Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights according as it is written of him. You know, Jesus, everything Jesus did was by prophecy. So he just fulfilled prophecy. Otherwise, nothing. And then also theologians believe, you know, that those 40 days of fasting and prayer, if you observe very well, even the temptation, all of that was a summary of all that Jesus did where fasting, prayer, and temptation was concerned, it was summarized in that verse of scripture. You know, theologically, there's an explanation for it. There's no significance to numbers. Don't be carried away by numbers. Nine, the number of birth. September, to remember. All that. Bible says if you're born of God, days don't mean anything anymore to you. So don't allow anybody to manipulate you by giving you days and calendar and all of that. The second of our last three callers. Hello. Hello, good evening. Many thanks for joining us, ma'am. Your name, where are you calling from? Yes, my name is Patton. And I'm calling from London. Um, okay. Yes, um, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adrian Dalina, um, for feeding us and helping you. Thank you. And um, thank you too, to our incontinental Mr. Bush. Thank you. Yes. Actually, my question borders around Acts chapter 19, verse 12. Okay. Where it was recorded that the handkerchief and apron from one of the disciples came to speak. Yes. In that regard, how would you analyze or emphasize um, the doctrine of handkerchief and other objects Used by some of the political pastors, especially here in London, very wrong time. I just need clarification on that thing. London, thank you very much. London, London, thank you. London needs a lot of help. So much help is needed in London. People just go to London and just work things and just collect all their monies and just play them. And the reason is because many of you in London don't have time to study the Bible. So anybody can just take advantage of you. And that's why you guys must pay attention. To the teaching of God's word. First of all, there's no doctrine of handkerchief anywhere in the Bible. There's no such doctrine. Now, an event happened once, and it was not the disciples that gave them the handkerchief. The people brought their handkerchiefs and robbed the bodies of the men of God. If it's today somebody brings handkerchief and robbed my body, I won't drive him away. But I will teach him what is more important than him putting a handkerchief on me. And the book of Acts is eyewitness account. So when the writer saw what people did, he just recorded it, not as a doctrine, but as a journalistic reportage. That is why after Acts, the doctrine of scripture begins from Romans. From Romans to Jude, you won't see any application of handkerchiefs anywhere. And the reason is because God's power, the totality of God's power is contained in God's word. And the mission is to save. So my advice don't let anybody carry you away by those, those um, so-called doctrine of, of elements. They are just, they are just uh, weapons so-called men of God use to take advantage of people that don't study, people that don't have time to read their Bibles. They use it and just... It's like going to a native doctor, you know? It's, it's, it's like going to a native doctor. You go to a native doctor, they give you something. So now, since people don't want to go to native doctors, 
They go to pastors. They give them something. I mean, one time a pastor went to London with a perfume and told London, London people to come and line up that he was going to spray perfume on them and it will bring favor to their lives, but they have to pay 700 pounds. And they were paying 700 pounds for perfume to be sprayed on them. I mean, what kind of... How do, you, how do people read their Bibles? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if the Christ in you cannot give you favor, is there a bottle of perfume? Comparing spirituals with spiritual, natural with natural. This natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit. The only thing that will make sense to a natural man is perfume, handkerchief, broom, koboko. But people that are born of the spirit don't have respect for any of those elements because they have respect for the word of God. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So that's the position of scripture on articles and elements. From the Americas, we dash to Europe, Italy. Hello, Global Baba and Mr. Bush. I'm from Italy. Thank you, Global Baba, for the word of God you're feeding us with. More grace, sir. Please, Global Baba, pray for my little daughter. She's always crying, and anytime she does that, she uses her fingers to injure her face. In the night, she will find it difficult to sleep. Also, also pray for my husband and me to find a favorable job. Thank you, Global Baba. I think we just use that as a point of contact. To pray, pray for, for other all people. others. Yes. Father, we want to pray for everybody today who needs a miracle. Those that are sick, we declare their bodies healed. Those that are expecting a miracle financially, we ask for favor and we ask for direction. We decree that those believing for the fruit of the womb receive a miracle in the name of Jesus. Amen. And those trusting you for papers to be signed, papers to be approved, in the name of Jesus, God's favor is at work on your behalf. And we declare every need met supernaturally in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, producer, wow. we need to go. The production team, on your behalf, this is Michael Bush, your anchor, inviting Global Baba to take us home. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. Now, listen to me. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. Don't forget to follow all our teachings on radio tonight. We're on radio at, at 9 to 10. Um, that's, that's inspiration. Inspiration, time. 10 to 12. Heritage, Heritage tomorrow time. morning. 5.45 a.m. XL, XL and then tomorrow morning 11 to 1 Radio Aquai Bomb 1 to 3 XL FM 3 to 5 you know your FM. FM and in the evening we're back here at 6 p.m. on Comfort FM we love all of you for giving us the opportunity to serve you looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow and until then enjoy the grace of Christ goodbye from Uyo Nigeria amen, amen.